What's up, everybody? This is Matt here from the Arnie's, joined with... Austin Terry. Wow, our little co-host. Yeah, guys, so uh, today is our normal day where we review The Mandalorian Season 2. This time we're breaking down Episode 7. But before the episode starts, we just wanted to let you know that for the first 15 minutes or so, we kind of break down that Disney investor meeting where they basically let the world know what their plans for the future of Star Wars is with all their new shows and movies. So just in case, you know, you start this episode and you're a bit confused or not talking about The Mandalorian, just skip ahead a little bit to around the 15 minute mark. And that's where we're going to start breaking down the actual episode. But for those of you that are actually interested in the future of Star Wars and our thoughts on then I guess you just got a little bonus. Yeah, I think we just had so much stuff we were excited about that we may have gone a little long-winded, but it was a fun conversation. So once again, if you don't care about any of the Disney investor stuff, the Mando talk will start right around that 15-minute mark, so feel free to skip ahead. Without further ado, everyone, enjoy the episode. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of The Arnie's. I'm your host today, Matt Johnson, joined as always by my good buddy, Austin Terry. Austin, how are you? I'm doing great. Happy to be here. Uh, couldn't be more excited to talk Mad Max The Mandalorian. Oh, interesting. We might have to break down that comparison in a little bit. Uh, before we get too far in, obviously, we are missing our normal Mandalorian host, Keith. He is off celebrating his sister's graduation, so we wish them the best. Have a great time. Anyway, Keith will give us his thoughts on this episode next week when we discuss the finale of Season 2. Well, before we go any further... I know you're trying to get through the intro without saying it, but people may be confused. This is not our normal episode of the Arnie's. This is, of course, something different. Matt, why don't you break down what exactly this is? I suppose I can. Of course, all of our main episodes come out on Tuesdays. This is our special bonus series we are doing. And that means since we're breaking down The Mandalorian, we're using our lame podcast within the podcast title. We're the Mandos talking the Lorians today. So that's who we are. Enjoy the title. And I hope you enjoyed the episode because we're about to break everything down. But before we do that, Austin, we figured, you know what? We're missing Keith today. So we wanted to have a fun little opening conversation topic. And we were like, what can we do? And luckily, you know, Lucasfilm, Star Wars, Marvel, everybody got together for the Disney Investor Day yesterday. And they kind of broke down what we can expect from the future of Star Wars. I think you and I and maybe even Keith, based on our Star Wars series we did. We kind of thought, you know, we have the Mandalorian probably get like an Ahsoka spinoff and who knows, eventually we'll probably get that Taika Waititi Star Wars movie they've mentioned. And I mean, that's probably it. Who the hell knows what else they're going to do? Well, turns out (laughs) not only are they doing all those things, but they're also going to do they're doing 10 Star Wars series over the course of the next few years, as they're putting it. Ten. Uh, Patty Jenkins, the director of Wonder Woman, was also revealed to be directing a Rogue Squadron movie, which I don't know too much about except from the video games for the N64 and kind of those early Nintendo days. So that was pretty cool, kind of focusing on that obvious squadron. So that's pretty cool. We don't know too much else about it. And of course, there's that Taika film. But Austin, should we talk about some of these series they announced? Because, you know, since we're breaking down The Mandalorian right now, these are 10 potential series that we might also do bonus episodes in the future. (laughs) We do have what looks like may to be a Mandoverse on our hands because we have Ahsoka, which will be the spinoff show starring Rosario Dawson. And then we have the Mandalorian semicolon Rangers of the New Republic. So I'm assuming those guys from episode two of this season will be back. Yeah, I was can I, I guess I should have looked into that one. I was more interested in some of the other series. But yeah, when they announced that, I guess either they're talking about those specific characters, but more likely just, I guess, a story focusing on you know, the New Republic and what that means. But the more interesting thing is it almost feels like these three series going forward, maybe less of the Mandalorian, but particularly Ahsoka and then the Rangers show, they've kind of described it as almost like the their little mini Star Wars CW verse. Because apparently these shows will kind of continue to their own stories, but apparently they will like they made a point to say that they will cross over and have like 
events that involve all of these characters. So that's pretty cool. Like, I mean, we've talked about this series, how how Ahsoka might fit in in the future. So it sounds like they could do their own cool stories, like Ahsoka going after Thrawn, like she mentioned. But at the same time, it's like we can expect them to come together at various points, which is pretty exciting. And of course, anytime the CW gets mentioned on this show, I do need to say, hopefully a little bit higher quality than what mm. gets offered from the CW. But I'm sure if it's in Disney Plus's hands, we'll be good to go. Agreed, agreed. So we got a bit more info on some other series that we already knew about. Uh, the first being Andor, which we, again, like I said, already knew about the series kind of focusing on Cassie and Andor before the events of Rogue One, how he kind of got to where he was working with the Rebellion, kind of some of the dark deeds, I suppose, that they mentioned in Rogue One that he was participating in in order for the betterment of the Rebellion and what that could mean. I assume K2SO is involved in some fashion. Oh, I hope so. Funniest droid in Star Wars. I agree. I agree. But Austin, I want to hear your thoughts on this one because you are definitely the biggest Rogue One fan out of the three of us. So what was your thoughts on hearing more info about this one? I'm weirdly not too interested in this one. Um, I felt like Andor played a great role in the movie Rogue One, but I don't know if I need a whole like show dedicated to him. It's actually funny because... You being not that excited isn't too surprising to me just because, I mean, I liked, like you said, I love Diego Luna and he was great and Rogue One, but it's like, is there enough there? But ironically, for me, someone that was a bit less interested in Rogue One, I was actually kind of excited when they announced this because Diego Luna, who's also an executive producer, made a point to say he remembered being at the premiere and he was kind of like, oh, this is such a bittersweet moment because I'm so excited to be a part of Star Wars, this franchise that I love, but... I knew going into this whole project, it was just going to be one movie and that was it. So it's kind of like we actually get to find out more about these characters, which for me was my biggest problem with Rogue One that I like. I liked the journey they were going on, but I just felt like I hardly knew any of them. So the fact that we are going to find out a lot more about Cassie and specifically and maybe K2SO in the process, depending on how long they were together, is something kind of appealing to me. You know, it's not my favorite announcement out of all these shows, but certainly I'm going to watch it for sure. Well, and he's a different... um you know, Republic member than, than we've kind of seen. He's a little bit yeah. more hardened. He's yeah. willing to kind of do some darker stuff as well. So it could make for an interesting show. I Absolutely. guess I just, I, I'm definitely going to watch it. I guess I just never really felt like while I was watching Rogue One, I never was like, man, I really want to see a show about Andor, you know, but yeah. we'll see what they do. I mean, I'll be interested to see a trailer for sure. Yeah, I agree. And maybe with this, the success of that, could we get a show focusing on other ones? I mean, specifically for me, like we talked about in our Rogue One review, I, I was always so confused about the relationship and origin of um, Chira Imwe and Baze Malbus. I remember their names played by Donnie Yen. He played Chira. I can't remember the actor that played Baze, but their kind of friendship and how they were somehow connected to the force. Like that seemed interesting and odd to me. So anyway, who knows what the success of the show could lead to. But again, awesome. Before we go on to other new stuff, we got another big one. We've known about for a long time. It's been delayed significantly. I feel like it was supposed to come out maybe this year or like beginning of 2021, but they stopped production to completely rework the scripts. And it is now coming out in early 2022, I believe, if I heard them right. And that is Obi-Wan Kenobi. We do have a we do have a title, though. We do what? have a full title. Do you know this? Do you don't know what this is? Is it Obi-Wan and Little Annie? <laughs> no, no, it's it's Obi Wan Kenobi semicolon the Hayden Christensen story. Oh, uh, Hayden Christensen's back. They they said he's back as Darth Vader. Which basically was like, hey, we don't want to look at your face on screen, so we're gonna put you in this entire costume. I know that's the weird part about the announcement is it's so clear that that's not what they meant. Like it, it's either we're gonna get some really cool flashbacks to the Clone Wars, which will be in live action. Which how cool would that be? Or there's gonna be you can already picture it. There's gonna be some scenes of a ragged older Obi-Wan sitting around a fire on Tatooine with his hood up and he's all, you know, he has PTSD from the events and his failures with Anakin and then who shows up? Ooh, is it a dream? I don't know. But Annie's here and there's a storm coming. Oh, I hope it's the latter. I would love to see more live action Darth Vader fighting action. Well, that, again, that's why it was so confusing because whenever they announced he was back immediately, I was like, okay, we're gonna get some really cool live action flashbacks, which I was actually really excited for. But then they made a point to say it's the rematch of the century. And then I think both Hayden Christensen and Ewan McGregor said that they're going to have like another swing at each other. So it's like, how the hell does that work? Because it feels like in A New Hope that they haven't seen each other since Mustafar. So I'm curious what that could mean. Well, that was the rematch. <laughs> that shitty, I know. That shitty scene we got in A New Hope was the rematch. <laughs> I know. So it's like, what could that mean if something happened in the middle there? I don't know. Either way, he's back. I'm excited. This is coming from someone that 
after rewatching Attack of the Clones and Revenge of the Sith for our Star Wars series, I kind of I I I hate Hayden Christensen in Attack of the Clones. He has some good scenes, but I actually thought he was really good in Revenge of the Sith. So you know what? And someone that's nostalgic for it, I grew up with those movies. I'm excited to see him back. He he doesn't do a lot of movies anymore, so I'm looking forward to seeing how they play off of each other once again. Yeah, I, I'm definitely more excited for Ewan McGregor to be back in the role. I don't think I ever really needed to see Hayden Christensen in the Darth Vader suit again. Um, but we'll see what they do. Like we said, I, like we said with Andor, we'll see what they do. And I'm pumped to see a trailer for this. I guess the last thing we do need to mention, I'm sure you'll appreciate this, Matt, because you love this movie, but we are getting a Lando event series also coming to Disney+. Plus. Weird as hell to me that they didn't even clarify this was Donald Glover. I mean, I have to assume Billy Dee Williams is obviously fantastic, but I, it sounds like Donald Glover will be the lead. But I thought, I thought it was weird they didn't confirm it, so... I'm wondering if it's possible. Maybe this is too much to hope for, but is there a way that we get like an older Billy D. Williams as Lando as like a framing device for the series that then focuses on the younger Lando as Donald Glover? I don't know because they didn't tell us, but either way, I'm excited. They were very clear to state it was an event, so it seems like they're hoping this will be unlike anything we've seen in Star Wars before. So maybe that is a possibility. Yeah. And as somebody that really, as you know, I like I said, you're the highest on Rogue One. I'm certainly the highest on Solo. And I, I can't remember, Austin, you'll have to fill me in, like, whether, I know you don't love Solo, but maybe you liked Alden Eric, Aaron Rick, I can't remember. Either way, I'm excited because, regardless of your thoughts on Solo, I thought they were setting up some really cool stuff for potential sequel or just another movie or show that would continue that in some way. So I have to imagine, if we're getting Lando, we might get at least bits and pieces of the future relationship of like Lando and Han and working with Jabba, how that went, how they met Boba Fett, stuff like that. I don't know. Yeah, I uh, I thought Alden was just fine in Solo. I think for me, Donald Glover is really the high point of that movie. So I really hope he's in this series because um, yeah. I, I definitely want to see more of Donald Glover's Lando. And who knows? I know Alden and, and Donald have said they really enjoyed working together. So maybe yeah. there is a way to have him in this show as well. Maybe we finally find out how the hell Amelia Clark working with Darth Maul, how that went, what that means. I have no idea. Either way, excited for that one for sure. Any other highlights from this, Austin? Because they did tell us that they're giving us a droid story, an animated show focusing on C-3PO and R2-D2. So that'll Yawn. be a number one watch. <laughs> uh, there was actually another cool one that I did not expect. They announced one called Star Wars Visions, which is they're taking together some of the like the most beloved Japanese anime creators. And they're all going to create some really cool in-universe Star Wars, like separate anime vignettes. I was like, that sounds kind of cool. So I'll probably oh, check that out. Yeah, that's a cool idea. Um, and there's some other ones. There was one called Star Wars Acolyte, but I can't remember what that one was about. I think it goes back in the past of the High Republic and stuff like that. So there, there's a lot. Like there's the Bad Batch, a Clone Wars spinoff and so many shows coming. So we're probably going to end up talking about some of these. Who the hell knows? But it was a fun event with lots of cool info nonetheless. Yeah, I guess my closing statement will be um, I'm really happy that Patty Jenkins is joining this franchise. I, I love what she did with Wonder Woman. I, I think she's going to bring some really cool things to the table for this franchise. And I'm also glad that they did confirm that that Taiki Wahidi movie is still on because I would love to see a Star Wars movie in his hands as well. Yeah, that that's a great point to end on because after all these cool, fun announcements, we really only got the confirmation of two movies. Um, the Patty Jenkins Rogue Squadron, which, from what I understand, would take place within a timeline that we're already familiar with and have seen. Whereas the Taika Waititi movie, we don't really know anything about. And also, they said that Kevin Feige was working on when he was producing it. You have to imagine with his relationship with Taika, with the Thor films, is Taika writing and directing this movie and Kevin is producing it or these different movies? My point being, it seems like the only movie that they've announced that will take place in a completely different time period than we've seen is the Taika movie. That's the only one that's floating out there right now. And they confirmed it, which is pretty interesting. And we have no idea where it takes place. I have to imagine it's not like the Skywalker saga. Well, we do know it's going to start out on a uh, sandy planet that they'll say it's not Tatooine, but it definitely will look like Tatooine. Oh, was it Jakku? Not Jakku. This one's actually Joku. Oh, Joku. I love Joku. All Taika's uh, comedy, they have to call it Joku. Um, so I'm excited for the future of Star Wars. And that's coming from someone that got a bit burnt out and they announced 10 series. They announced Mando season three coming next year. They announced two movies. And I got to say... Maybe it's because we rewatched all the Star Wars movies. Maybe it's because we're watching Mandalorian and I'm liking it a lot more now. I'm kind of excited for all this stuff. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't. I would not have said that a year ago. They did kind of say though what like their new like uh, corporate mantra is for all their employees. It is if you're not burnt out on Star Wars yet, 
You will be soon. There you go. If you're not burnt out yet, don't worry, you will be. <laughs> same, <laughs> same with Marvel. The, we thought they announced a lot of Marvel stuff, you know, like last year, but they announced like 10 plus. So it's just a crazy time for people that love Disney Plus and all their content. So, Well, Matt, should we transition into the main thing people are here for, which is our thoughts on The Mandalorian Season 2, Episode 7? Let's do it. But before we do that, Austin, as always, give me your quick recap thoughts. If someone's just jumping aboard for the first time, what have been your quick thoughts on Season 2 up to this point? Season two, I'm going to say, has been fantastic so far. I think John Favreau and team have really taken what worked in season one and just continued to approve on it. They have really crafted a compelling and fun journey for the audience to go on. And I say fun because I don't think we get to say that too often with Star Wars, but we are actually having fun in this franchise. I also think this season has been full of fan service, but I do mean that as a compliment because I think they found a way to do it in all the right ways. In terms of episode seven, um, I think you could argue it's a bit of a side mission. However, with that being said, it does take place in a cool setting and have some pretty sweet action as well. We also do get the return of Bill Burr, which is always fun. So, I mean, aside from like a 10 minute sequence that I'm sure we're going to talk about, I really enjoyed this week's episode and can't wait to see what we've got in store for the finale. I agree with you. Yeah, without going into spoilers yet, I've really been loving season two coming from someone that did not like season one. As I've said each episode, the pilot of season one and the finale, I thought were awesome. Everything in between just felt like a side story with little to no payoff and it took too long to get to the good stuff. Whereas season two has just been impressing me ever since the first episode. There's been a couple downs along the way, but honestly, not anything anywhere near to make me turn off a series or not enjoy it. I've been loving it. This is, season has genuinely turned me into a fan of this show and I think just made me appreciate this period of Star Wars even more. So... And episode seven was no like exception. I loved it. And yeah, Austin's right. This one, certainly compared to some other ones this season, was a bit more of a side thing. But the cool thing about it is side stories this season have more payoff. And this one we know directly is going to lead into the big finale and what all that means is so exciting. So I can't wait to break it down. I love this episode. That's our non-spoiler thoughts, everybody. So definitely recommend it. If you haven't started this season of The Mandalorian at all, go and watch it. And once you get to episode seven... You'll see why we like this one as well. And with that, it's time to get into spoilers. So, Austin, let everybody know to get the hell out of here. Have you not watched this episode yet? Get the hell out of here. What are you doing? Why would you click on a Mandalorian Season 2 Episode 7 podcast if you haven't watched it yet? But yes, we are going to be spoiling this episode. So this is your final warning. Give us a pause and come on back. We'll be here waiting for you if you haven't watched it yet. If you wanted to hear us talk about Hayden Christensen coming back for the Obi-Wan series, I get it. But if you haven't seen this episode yet, we're about to spoil it. So get out and come back. Okay, there we go. All right, everybody. Welcome back to your official Mandalorian Season 2, Episode 7, Spoiler Talk. This episode is called The Believer. And this one is exciting because it was written and, well, hold on, I should say, it was directed and written by Rick Famuyiwa, who directed Dope, and he directed two episodes of season one of The Mandalorian, episode two and episode six, I believe. It was the episode that, you know, they introduced Bill Burr's character, that heist episode. So he directed those two, and he is back this season writing as well, so that was cool to see. And let's go through our cast real quick before breaking it down. We got Pedro Pascal not only playing The Mandalorian, but we got to bring him back up. It's Din Djarin. He came back, took that mask off. We have Mayfeld, played by the great Bill Burr, of course. Cara Dune is back as Gina Carano. Boba Fett, of course, played by Tamora Morrison. Fennec Shand, Ming-Na Wen. And Moff Gideon, Giancarlo Esposito. So this episode was very much, you know, we're, it kind of feels like the team is finally finding its footing. You know, we're seeing a lot of familiar faces in a good way. It's actually feeling like we're going to spend enough time with these characters. So I certainly appreciated that. Austin, what did you think of that title drop? the writing and the directing, the cast, anything to mention there before we get to the episode summary. I think everybody here has standout performances in this episode. I don't love that we see Pedro's face. We're going to talk about that later, but I do still think he gives a great performance in this episode, especially since this is kind of one of the few episodes that we know for sure he is on set um, acting in this season. So, right. And of course, we got to shout out Bill Burr back doing a great job. Who knew this guy would be such a great addition to the Star Wars universe, but I love his character and I love the performance he brings to the show. 
Yeah, he was great. So many standout scenes. We're going to break those down in a second here. But first, let's just give you all a quick reminder of what happened this episode. So Mando and the gang recruit Mayfeld, played by Bill Burr, into their custody in order to acquire the coordinates to Moff Gideon's ship. Mayfeld directs them to a hidden Imperial Rhydonium refinery on the planet Morak. Mayfeld and Mando hijack an Imperial transport and disguise themselves as soldiers, and they battle pirates on the way to the facility. They find the terminal they need in the officer's mess hall after arriving, but Mayfeld, of course, fears being recognized after seeing his former commanding officer. Mando decides to go instead and removes his helmet to acquire the codes via a facial scan. He is confronted by Valen Hess, and Mayfeld intervenes, leading to a tense drink where Hess insults dead soldiers from Operation Cinder. Mayfeld kills Hess, and the two fight their way to the roof, with Fennec and Dune providing covering fire. Boba Fett, of course, arrives to pick them up, after which Mayfeld destroys the refinery with a well-placed sniper shot. Mayfeld is then let go for helping them out, and finally, Mando sends Moff Gideon a message threatening him and vowing to rescue Grogu in the finale, hopefully, fingers crossed. Anyway, he threatens him, and it was awesome. All right, so let's get to our discussion topics. Austin, lead us off. So we get some pretty sweet action in this episode, and it doesn't take long uh, for things to kick off. There's a really cool sequence where uh, Mayfield has to drive this car full of uh, an explosive material that the Empire has been mining, and Mando has to fight off pirates um, on top of this transport vehicle. It's pretty sweet hand-to-hand combat, and Mando actually feels pretty vulnerable in this scene because he is in Stormtrooper armor. He's not in his typical Baskar armor. Yeah, I really love that. Like, I love seeing him put up his arms to block like he usually does, but instead his the armor plating just shatters and he's like, oh shit. So he has to be a bit yeah. more careful here and he has to kind of, um, he his gun malfunctions right away. So he's really trying to throw people off and at the same time, they're all trying to use these thermal detonators. So he's trying to push them back and blow them up before they get there. So this was really fun. I mean, we talk all the time about how this show feels like a video game. This one felt like one in so many different ways, like being on top of this big car, throwing people off, they're trying to jump on, and then cutting back inside to Mayfeld, who, it's like that thing in the video game where you're you're hauling <laughs> precious cargo, so you can't drive too fast or be too crazy with your movements, and he was doing that too. And also speaking of video games, it's also that kind of typical thing they do where you, you finally have leveled up all the way, you've gotten all your sweet gear, and oh. then they take it all away from you, and you have to fight without it as well. The Mass Effect 2 connection, yes. There you go, yeah. <laughs> I don't know why that was. That was the only example that came to my mind. I'm sure there's better ones. Well, that one's in space, too. That's why I thought of it. There you go. And then also I'll say that I also appreciated that Mando is actually involved in the fight for the first time yes. in four months, it feels like. Yeah, yeah. Each episode, it seems like, you know, for example, in episode three, he's trapped on that boat. And because Bo-Katan has to kind of show off and her team are the big part of that episode. And then, of course, the Boba Fett reveal. He and Fennec Shand are the big part. So I know, yeah, Austin, like you, I- I've been OK with it. But Austin's been a bit more like, I want to see more Mando. So we can't complain about that this time because he and Bill Burr were the stars here. You know, they were the stars of this action. Really cool how he just like kind of adapts to every situation, too. Like, he, yeah. like he is so so willing and able to just adjust his fighting style to whatever the situation calls for. Also, though, you mentioned Boba Fett there. Were you a little bummed that he wasn't involved too much in this episode? He is pretty much absent until the closing shots. Um, I know we do have a pretty big ensemble this week and we do have a limited time, but what are we kind of looking for in terms of involvement from this character in this series? Yeah, I was a little bit bummed like for a second, but then I was like, well, you know what? I shouldn't be bummed because he was basically the star of the last episode. And like I mentioned at the top, I think... This episode is kind of about, it's like a smaller setup to the bigger finale coming next week, which is going to presumably involve his whole team as well. So I think he's going to play a much bigger part there. So it was just kind of a little bit of a tease and showing them working together. So then I was like, okay, I really like this. Um, as for what I'm looking for, I don't know. I, I just want it to be a big part of next week, be a, like an active part of the team. And I think the more interesting question is, you know, he said, whenever the kid's back, our debt's paid. And it's going to be one of those things with, you know, we've spent time together. What will that mean once presumably Grogu is back in the hands of the Mandalorian if that does happen? If that does happen, do we see Boba and Fennec decide, you know what, let's stay a team. You know, you don't have a ship. You can hang out with us on the Slave One. I I don't know. I I don't know if that's what I want, if that's what will happen. 
kind of it seems like there's a bunch of interesting options they have depending on how the next week's finale plays out yeah i I weirdly didn't really notice he was absent until he comes in at the end and and we'll talk about a little later but he does have some really cool stuff to do so i did appreciate that um i certainly do not want this to become the mando and boba show right I, i definitely don't want that i would love it if there's a way for him to be involved in like one or two episodes each season yeah basically the it's the way carl weathers and uh gina carano are involved now i guess right like that's how you yeah, would want him cool. and Fennec to be involved in the future? Yeah, no, I definitely do think there is a way for him to join the show, kind of one or two episodes a season, and then cut out. Um, I just think it is kind of weird to have a presence like Boba Fett on screen and then not really use him a whole lot in the episode. So if he is going to be involved in the future, I hope there is. I hope they come up with some like creative ways to still have him be pretty active in, in whatever episodes he does appear in. Yeah, and he looked pretty uh, different in this episode. He got that full new paint job. Obviously, he has the same colors, but... I'm curious how Boba Fett purists might feel because he looks very different. You know, he gave that armor a fresh paint job. I think he looks really cool because we talked about how last week. Yeah, I think he looks better. Yeah, it looked a bit weird with the black, um, uh, whatever you want to call it, like coat essentially hanging out. But having that black coat with the freshly coated armor, I was like, okay, I'm liking this final form Boba Fett look. So we'll see how that plays out in the future for sure. So speaking of characters that we want involved in the future of this show, we got to talk about Bill Burr. This guy really brings it uh, in this series. And I I do really hope they find a way for him to keep coming back at least once a season. Yeah, I mean, it seems like because, again, at first at the end, I was like, that's interesting that they let him go because it kind of felt like. Well, you know, I wonder if, you know, Mayfeld, after having this change of heart, maybe he'll be like, OK, look, I'm not going to be a part of your team, but I'll at least let's let's go to the ship. I'll help you get the kid back. Um, at first, I was like, I wonder why they didn't do that. But then they let him go. And it was a fun scene. Like, I like them saying, well, Mayfeld died. And he's like, should I go? And then he kind of like nods him on. So he kind of runs off. Um, but it, what I'm saying is that felt purposeful because it's like now he's not dead, clearly, and he's going off. So there's there's no way Bill Burr doesn't come back, I would say, at least once a season. So I, th- I think you're on the right track there. I think we're going to be seeing Bill Burr in the future, which excites me because I love him in this show. He just seems – he's such an outsider, but he somehow fits at the same time. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you said that because it doesn't feel like it's Bill Burr just on The Mandalorian. Like it, he actually is like really showing off his acting skills here, and, and I definitely buy into the fact that he's bought into this character and definitely has some talent as an actor. Oh, for sure. Without a doubt. I really like the scenes that he shared with Mando, which were kind of, I guess, the main part of the episodes whenever they're in the actual transport. And he's basically, I think he's just trying to get Mando to talk um, and he's trying to relate to him and say, we're not that different. Mando, of course, barely talks. And then whenever he says like that, he disagrees. But there was some really interesting stuff here whenever um, Mayfeld talks about you find out who you truly are whenever shit hits the fan. That's when you know what your actual line is and when you can cross it. And as long as you can still sleep good at night, then you're doing better than most. I was like, that's kind of interesting. And it felt like a fascinating element for a former Imperial sniper to have who's now defected. He's a criminal sometimes, but sometimes like here, even though he's being forced to help, it seems like he actually wants to. It's sometimes So it's kind of this interesting dichotomy that I really love. And it really paid off at the end of the episode when he seemingly genuinely is wishing them well. And I loved, I think my favorite moment of this episode, Austin, was he's kind of giving him shit the whole time about how, like, you know, you say your rule is you can't take off your helmet, but then it's like, oh, as long as nobody sees your face. So what is it? Like, you're such... He, it, it annoys him. And then whenever Mando actually has to take it off, there's this great scene after he kills Hess at the end where he um, basically tells Mando, I'm sorry, man, but I, I had to do it. And then he looks – he purposefully looks away from him and then hands him the Stormtrooper helmet and is like, I never saw your face. I was like, oh, such a good moment. I, I loved it. I loved seeing this human side to this character. And I think like we already talked about, the fact that it's Bill Burr makes it – fit in an even cooler way in the star wars universe yeah i really like that he is questioning mando's rules throughout this episode and i I really like that he's clear to state hey you you tweak your rules when you get desperate right like he's he's very clear to lay that out he said and then he also points out you and i we're just both survivors we've done different stuff to survive but that's all we are mm-hmm. and mando of course disagrees like you said but they have a really interesting relationship and, and i felt they really improved upon their relationship from the first season here yeah. as well yeah um i personally don't love the sequence of Mando taking off his helmet, but I love I love everything you get from Bill Burr during right. those sequence of events, both before and after. Agreed, agreed. And it's also cool because he brings up how they're similar, but the one cool thing about that scene later in the officer's mess hall is whenever Bill Burr is talking about Operation Cinder and his experiences working under this commanding officer, you can clearly see without 
Din Djarin talking, the Mandalorian, of course, without him speaking, you see how he looks at him. And then I think part of the reason at the end where he's being kind of playful, like, yeah, it is a shame Mel Mayfeld died in the explosion. I think he kind of realized, yeah, we are survivors. We've gone through similar situations and it was a cool payoff for sure. All that said, Austin, I, I hope you can help me here because there was one kind of, despite all these great moments, there was one thing that maybe I missed it, but I was just, huh? So Bill Burr gets in this transport, right? They're dressed up as the stormtroopers and he's wearing the helmet. And then he takes it off pretty quick in and is like, ah, it's so stuffy in there or whatever. And I was like, okay, he's just going to drive it without it. Fine, whatever. They get to this refinery and he doesn't put the helmet back on. Did I like, did I miss something? Why was he so like interested in keeping it off? And then the second they run into somebody that he recognizes Two seconds after leaving this transport, he's like, oh, shit, like, I might get recognized. And it's like, put your helmet on. Like, why is he not putting it on? I was so confused here. <laughs> like, they're undercover. And he was a former Imperial. Like, I get it. It's a big galaxy. But you could run into somebody that recognizes you. I was so confused. Did you read that situation differently? Like, why I didn't put it on? No, it was very jarring to me as well. To answer your first question there, I, I don't know why he doesn't put it on when he leaves the transport. But that my genuine only answer is that when they were negotiating Bill Bird's return, he said, I'm not covering up my face. <laughs> yeah. So that was that's that's and that's not a joke. That's my genuine answer. I really think he said, I'm not covering my face. To answer your second question, I I think you can make an argument. The reason he doesn't put on his helmet then is because that machine has to scan faces and maybe he is still planning to try and get to that machine somehow. OK, well, actually, that that is probably why. I guess, yeah, I think you're right. I think that's. I the guess answer. you could also say he knows the whole time this machine has to scan a face. Well, and he maybe does. That is also why he never yeah. puts his helmet back on, too. But it is weird to to walk through the mess hall and all that. That, he that doesn't would, have yeah, his yeah, on. yeah. To your point, it's fine if he he does know that. But it to me, it was weird. It's like literally just leave it on, just walk over, and then when if you're going to be standing in the small little corner, then take it off and do it real quick and put it. back on. You know on. what? Do exactly what Pedro did. Oh. Walk over with your helmet on and take it off. <laughs> yeah, that seemed like the better move. And the only reason that I feel like the superior officer saw him is because Bill Burr <laughs> walks into the room, <laughs> stares at the guys like, fuck, and then leaves. <laughs> you, you have to imagine the superior officer is like, well, that was weird. And then Mando's like, don't worry, I got it. And then he walks into the must hell as well right after, just stands in the archway, motionless, Everybody's staring at him, and then he does a half-ass salute, and then walks over. Like, I feel like a fucking first-day Empire member would have been like, those guys aren't, they shouldn't be here. <laughs> like, it was so funny. Oh. Well, let's get into it right now. It's helmet removal time. I think you and I might disagree here. To me, this felt pretty forced and unnecessary. Um, I know that they do take his helmet off briefly in season one, but for me, that felt more natural and more satisfying, uh, mainly because IG-11 does find a way to get some redemption in that scene and proves that he is a nurse droid and no longer a hunter. Um, he also makes a point to say, I'm not a living thing, so you're not breaking your creed. And it feels important because Mando needs to get his injuries fixed. He literally would have died, yeah. It feels extremely necessary for him to take off his helmet. Whereas here, it just felt kind of the same thing with Bill Burr. It felt like Pedro Pascal was like, I, I want my face to be on screen. And so they kind of found a way to work it in. That's what, It felt very forced to me. Yeah, I'm fine if we see him like once a season. I don't really mind. I, my, my main thing is you're right. In season one, it was extremely necessary because I can't remember how he got injured. But he, he got injured to a point where if he did not remove his helmet so that IG-11 could get in there and fix him up, he would have died. And it was this droid. He hated droids because they showed his flashback to the Clone Wars when droids massacred his village and his family. And so he never trusted them. And then IG-11 fixes him. And then we see in season two, he feels more comfortable with the droids. So it's this fun payoff. So I, I definitely like the scene more. I agree it was blocked a little strangely, like I already mentioned. Like he walks in after Bill Burr does this weird like slapstick bit where he walks in, oh, fuck, and then leaves. And the officer's like, that was weird. And then... Mando walks in, just stands there awkwardly, and then walks over, takes his helmet off. So it, it felt it was weird, like choreography wise. But once he did it, I mean, you get, the reason it worked for me is because is he about to die like he was in season one? No, but this still felt bigger and important to me because it is still a matter of life and death to him. Because it's like if I don't get these coordinates of where Moff Gideon's ship is, I don't know what's gonna happen to Grogu, and I'll never find him without this. So I'm willing to break my creed and show my face 
where people can clearly see me for the first time in decades because I love this kid so much and I'm going to save him. So I agree with you. It didn't work 100% for me because it, it felt like an awkward lead up to it. But the actual yeah. moment itself, I do think is powerful and impactful, like him taking it off and like the, the way they shot it of, off to the sides, so you can see all the people, not droids, all the people sitting in the room that can see him like his creed is broken. And I was like, this is a really powerful like scene to me. And it was also a fun callback from episode three of this season where he was so taken aback when Bo-Katan and her team took off their masks. And but they told him what that meant to them and how they believe a different thing. And it's kind of like. I'm curious to again how his creed and his arc might change over the course of this series, just based on the way the mask works. Is something as simple to us as that? So, it worked for me a lot better, but I, I, I don't, I don't fully disagree with you. And it, it didn't feel forced from a character perspective. Oh, sure. Like sure. For, for Mando as a character, it felt very important and necessary that he do this task. Yeah. It just felt, it just felt like from a story creation perspective, the writers purposely wrote this situation that would force him to take his helmet off. When they could have written a machine that scans thumbprints or something like that, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, like we're 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 pigeonholed into this scene where the only option is helmet removal, and so that's I, what he's okay. Do. Okay, I see what you're saying. That's a good point. And it was, again, also talk about awkward. The fact that he knows what he has to do, and I get it's hard. I'm not I'm not shaming him there, but the fact that he knows it's a facial scan and he walks up. And hits the button and it scans his helmet. And, still tries and it's almost to scan like it's helmet. almost like he's standing there hoping that that will work. It's like, bitch, like all of your helmets are the same. That's not gonna do anything. <laughs> and then uh yeah, to your point, it's not like Pedro Pascal then had an amazing moment at, at the um at the at the while they were drinking. Like he had some great um facial acting where he's reacting to what Bill Burr and Mayfeld are saying. But he didn't add anything to the conversation. In fact, it was almost like a joke, like, oh, he can't speak. He's been, you know, the pressure, like he was in a cab and it was a, uh, the pressure got all screwed up. So he's, he can't hear you or whatever. So they kind of played into it, but still it did lead to that grip. And what I mentioned where Bill Burr like looks away after all that and is like, I never saw your face. But um, yeah, I think it worked I love that at some points, too. but was That's an awesome scene. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Very much so. So what did you think about being in an Imperial mess hall? Right. Is it kind of jarring for you to be seeing imperial forces doing like everyday human tasks because mm -hmm. to me these guys throughout this franchise always feel like almost like this otherworldly force like they don't they don't seem human they don't seem like they have like regular everyday needs and so it just even when they do this in rogue one where they show scenes of um urso talking with his family on on an imperial star destroyer and flashbacks like even that was jarring to me just to see these soldiers and people that have been so evil throughout this franchise doing kind of just everyday mundane tasks. Yeah, well, we also so rarely see, quote, grunts or the lower ranks doing, like, menial tasks. Like, usually the people we're seeing are higher rank people, like, in a more pivotal role. So it almost feels yeah. like they have more agency in terms of their choice of being there. But yeah, I, I, I really liked this scene. It kind of felt in a weird, this really? is going to be a weird connection, but did you ever see that um, whenever Adam Driver was on SNL and he did those Kylo Ren sketches where he's like undercover boss and he's like trying to go, he's walking around oh, the, yeah, I think I did. the first order ships when they're just like doing their own thing, like stormtroopers with their helmets off in a mess hall eating and he's trying to <laughs> like integrate. It, obviously, it wasn't a silly thing, but yeah, it worked for me. I thought it was cool to see. It was like, hey, your obstacle here, you're getting out of this transport. You've just survived this crazy life and death Mad Max scenario, as you put it. And your goal isn't to kill everybody. You are just got to get to that terminal and get out. We'll provide cover fire if we need to. And I was like, this is kind of cool. Like, they just have to kind of get past people just going about their day. I guess I just don't understand the timeline of when it switched from clones to where it almost seems like here it's volunteers you know what i mean like i always thought that the soldiers were either clones or then orphans that the empire kidnapped and brainwashed so it, it just seems weird to see everyday people walking around this imperial base i don't think they've been i could be wrong i don't think they've been clones since um like whenever stormtroopers came about those uh were volunteers or people that people that they just took orphans like you mentioned people taken and all that stuff. So, yeah, it's been a while since uh, since the clones. But I get what you're saying. I mean, it definitely is a bit more jarring when you see people just kind of going about, like, cheering for them. Like, you made it. Good job. You, you got the Rhydonium here. You did it. Great. Um, and then yeah. just, like, hanging out. It makes basically. it less intimidating to me, too. Yeah, but I kind of – I guess I kind of liked that. I kind of liked it. It's like they're showing them 
as people, because even though they are the enemy when it comes to the rebellion, I mean, they still have to eat, you know? They still got to hang out, enjoy, drink every once in a while. I mean, they're doing life and death stuff too. So I don't know. It kind of worked for me seeing that setting. I guess that implies though that then that there are then everyday people who actively choose to be a part of the sure. empire and sure. not, not higher up people, like just everyday soldiers. Same like, with the rebellion, I, I'm sure. It just seems so weird to me. I guess, I guess they've never really explained how the Empire benefits an everyday person. So I don't know why an everyday person would then volunteer to join the Empire. Opportunity to escape. Think about Solo. They literally, that opening scene in Solo leads to this pretty cool looking uh, opportunity to sign up to be a pilot. I mean, Han, of course he does it because he has this whole thing of, I, I want to get back here someday and save Kira. But I mean, his goal before that was, I want to explore the galaxy. I want to fly among the stars. And I mean, if I can get to this place and sign up, I can literally be a pilot and I can do that. I don't have to stay with them. You know, I can do my what I have to do and then get out of there and have this, you know, skill set and this opportunity as a pilot. So I, that's a very specific example. But that's just, you know, we've seen it a little bit in the past of like, I guess that's true. I didn't think about Solo. I tend not to think about Solo. <laughs> yeah, I know. But we do. We have my point is this. We've seen that the Empire is stationed in certain places where it clearly does, I guess, benefit um a lower class person or person with less opportunities where at least it gives them something or a skill set to go somewhere else regardless of what their belief is so yeah i see your point um either way i guess it just worked for me because i just thought it was so jarring i guess i just thought it was in a good way to see them trying to navigate yeah. the setting and it was so weird to see people just hanging out having a drink and i don't know it worked for me but definitely definitely odd um before we go past that, though, I mean, how did what did you think of that? Um, the Valen Hess, the commanding officer and the Mayfeld scene where Mando is just kind of sitting there with his helmet off, just kind of watching them. But basically, the commanding officer is like gloating and he's like, what are we going to drink to? And then uh, Mayfeld talks about his past, kind of gives us a little bit of his origin whenever he was an Imperial. And uh, I thought that was pretty interesting talking about the casualties of war and who benefits like what it, again we talked with rogue one about it's actually the quote-unquote war of star Wars. so what did this scene mean to you did you like the scene yeah so i, I thought it was a great well-written scene um and certainly bill burr and, and richard brake give great performances in this scene um i just i found it kind of weird that the second bill burr's character goes what about the people that died how did it benefit them how did that guy immediately not go oh this guy's not a stormtrooper and like kind yeah. of start sounding the alarm i couldn't tell if he was drunk already or if he was oh, okay or again i guess he is kind of slurring his words yeah maybe a little bit or if he's just kind of like maybe it's just so unexpected to him that there could be people infiltrating them that he's just like I mean, yeah, that's fucked up, but I mean, he's still just trying to, well, again, at the same time, he is the commanding officer. So maybe before he wants to like reprimand this guy, maybe he wants to try and explain himself since there were so many casualties. I don't know. I, I get your point. I still, I enjoyed the conversation, but yeah, it, it was kind of like, he didn't seem too concerned with the fact that somebody was bringing it up, I guess. I also do love the line from Velen Hess when he's like, people want order, not freedom. Yeah. And the second they the second they realize they want that, they're going to come crawling back to us. Mm. Like, you can tell this guy's totally bought in on the Empire's mission. Completely agree. And again, it makes you wonder how this or something like it will morph into the First Order from the sequel trilogy. Yeah, especially because he said the New Republic's in disarray, so... Exactly. Uh, that was cool too. Like we're getting these subtle hints of how the first order came to be, and I really hope we get a big reveal in the finale. Either that, or I think there's no way we don't get more as the series goes on, because clearly they're bought into Mando, like as a series. So we're gonna get more, and I think we're gonna find out. I can't wait. And honestly, the show that seems like the more likely setting for that might be Star Wars Rangers. Yeah, could be. And if that kind of becomes the main background of that. I mean, again, I'm bought in because I'm already I'm already going to watch Ahsoka because I love Rosario Dawson. I love that episode. So I'm going to check that out. Rangers has to sell me a bit more. But if that's part of it, then I'm certainly going to be intrigued. So, yeah, we'll see what happens. But again, Austin, before we move on, fun fact for you and everybody listening. Richard Brake is a great actor uh, who played Valen Hess. I've seen him in so many things. He's a great character actor. I would recommend people go check out his IMDb page because you'll recognize him. He for looks a, familiar. Well, there you go. Because you'll recognize him in a bunch of stuff. But Austin, there is one character he's played that I know you especially will find interesting. And it's going to be the thing that you go, oh, that's what it is. So I, all I will say is it is a role in a superhero movie. It's not, he's not the, oh. it's not the banker in, no. uh, in the opening of The Dark Knight. It's a good it? guess. He plays Joe Chill in Batman Begins. 
Oh, that's what it is. There you go, everybody. Cool. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> and also, I will say, uh, speaking of things being jarring, how did you like that heroic music paired with the TIE Fighters and Stormtroopers coming out to save Mando and Mayfield? From the yeah, it, that was so interesting because I was like, <laughs> the Rangers from episodes two and whatever are back. Yeah. <laughs> and then I was like, oh, no. <laughs> I was like, oh, shit. I'm cheering for the wrong reason. Love how they paired it, though, with that music. I thought it was a, Again, a really nice dichotomy. Kind of like the mess hall scene where it's like, why am I? S- I'm excited they live, but now they're in like the wrong hand. So it was kind of this cool a uh, weird handling of that, but it was really interesting to me. Okay, so before we finish up here, we're going to talk about the final escape. Once Bill Burr's character Mayfeld finally is like, you know what, I'm fed up with Valen House. He shoots him, he shoots first, takes him out, and then we have one final escape sequence. Kind of the rest of the team wasn't involved with the rest of the story like we've talked about. I think that was on purpose to set up bigger involvement in the finale. But regardless, they'd still nailed it when it came to their smaller parts, Cara Dune and Fennec Shan providing cover fire as Bill Burr. I love how we're just saying Bill Burr. I, <laughs> but as Mayfeld and Mando, the uh, the show we pitched, Mando and Mayfeld, Mayfeld and Mando, either one, um, as they're trying to escape and getting to the roof. And then Boba shows up, picks them up. And then one final badass moment, Mayfeld, you know, call, calling back to his sniper roots, pulls off that great shot that impresses everybody where he destroys the Rhydonium and destroys the refinery. In the process, Austin, how did this final kind of badass sequence with all this fun action work for you? It was awesome. And I'm glad everybody had a piece of the action here. I love Fennec and Cara Dune covering them with their sniper fire. I thought they had some really nice moments and and really cool uh, blocked scenes as well with with the way the stormtroopers are climbing after them and then getting shot. Um, it's also cool to see their perspective of what the escape looks like. Mm -hmm. Like, I like that there are some wide angles where you can see it's kind of one long sequence. There was one... (laughs) Very clunky scene that made me laugh when I watched it, though. And there's a, a stormtrooper trying to climb out of a window, and you see his arm pop out, and then Mando just, like, crouches <laughs> over and shoots him. <laughs> I thought that was so funny. He's like, what's that guy trying to do? <laughs> I wish Keith was here, because... Oh, my gosh. And uh, maybe maybe this will be our, our little Keith test to see if he listens to this week's episode, but I do have a bit of a recant. Slave 1 looked awesome in sunlight yes. here. Nice. I'm glad you came around to it, but that's not what I thought you were going to say. What I thought you were going to say, Austin, is I don't know how I thought otherwise, but they did it. They brought back the best moment from Attack of the Clones. For me, I know you're a big fan of the of the Geonosis final fight, <laughs> but dude, that, that, that chase scene with Obi-Wan and Slave One in Attack of the Clones where they put off those seismic charges that are those those blue charges that fall out and explode with no sound and then just explode in a complete horizontal blast – Boba dropping that out of the Slave One, and the way that sounded and looked was so cool to me in this episode. I'm glad you actually called called it the proper turn, because I was just going to call it the Obi-Wan bomb. <laughs> Not a bad name. Not a bad name. You know what we're going to be calling the... We're gonna, you know what else we could call the Obi-Wan bomb? is Hayden Christensen when he comes back for the show in a couple <laughs> of years. <laughs> But no, dude, that looked so fucking sweet when that thing dropped out. I think I kind of, I think I kind of get the nostalgia now for Slave I One because when I saw yeah. that drop out of the ship, I was smiling from ear to ear. That, that was my biggest like reaction. I feel like to this episode where I was like actually smiling and like yes. Uh, so that was really fun. Why doesn't everybody have these bombs? I don't know. Like, it where does like he we get those? End the war very easily <laughs> yeah. with a few of those. <laughs> yeah, we need to find out where he buys those because those are uh, pretty powerful, as it turns out. Um, And then real quick, Austin, before we wrap up here, because that was kind of obviously the big moment. And we already talked about how they let Bill Burr's character go. But then we get this final shot, which is basically everybody like freaking out, like, oh, my God, they're coming after us. And all the um, Empire people are like, Moff Gideon, Moff Gideon, there's a message for you. And Mando basically just threatens him and is like, that kid means everything to me, means more to me than you'll ever know. I'm coming after him, coming after you. Did you like this as a final kind of stinger that leads into the finale next week? I actually didn't. Me neither. Um, I didn't either. I don't know why. It just seems weird for Mando's character. This doesn't seem like something he would do. He's not really a guy that seeks the spotlight. And he doesn't really... He fights when he needs to, but it's not like his goal is to always be fighting. Um, So it just seems weird that he's kind of like prepping Gideon for the coming battle almost. Yeah. That's kind of why it was, maybe I think that's a good way to put it, because I was wondering, why don't I like this? And maybe that was wise. It's like, just, uh, just, you, if, even if people are like aware at what happened at the refinery, just kind of like operate under the assumption that they're not, and just utilize yeah. the element of surprise. Just take the coordinates exactly. and He's go totally after them. Surprise. Don't let them know. So, yeah, I think that's probably ultimately why it came off as weird. 
it works for the character in terms of like threatening him and like the kid means so much to me. Like that was fine. It's just why is don't let him know you're coming. It seems like the words in this video were chosen very specifically. So I wonder if somehow this message is going to tie into next week's episode. Like it, it was a very awkward sounding message to send to your enemy. So I'm wondering if, if somehow this plays a bigger part than we realize. Maybe. Yeah. And if it does, I'm all for being proven wrong. So we'll see what happens. Um, and yeah, that was our final moment. And can't believe it. it's already been seven weeks, but yeah, next week we're going to be talking about the finale of The Mandalorian Season 2, and I could not be more excited. I cannot wait to see what happens. Is it, is it going to be like a happy ending where they get the kid back? Like, Austin, it, is somehow Moff Gideon... Is this the end of Moff Gideon in this series? Like, is this the last we see of him? Will he be killed, or is he going to somehow be in a situation where he can come back? Like, what do you think? Kind of hope it's the end. Um, I love Giancarlo Esposito, but it, w- yeah. it would be kind of nice to have a new villain for next season. Yeah. Um, and and it, if it's not the end, then we're kind of going to be doing the same stuff. Like, he's always going to be coming after the kid. So I think this would be a good time to end his kind of arc on this show and then bring us something new for next season. Yeah, I'd be down for that. What do you think? Is Ahsoka coming back? Well, that was the other question we have to talk about. I, I'm still, I'm still predicting... That I feel like the final shot of season two has to be whatever Jedi is answering Grogu's call from last episode. That that has to be the final scene. And I think Keith brought up a good point when we talked about that last week, which is, wouldn't it be a little bit weird if like Ahsoka was one that sent them to Tython and then he like calls out to the force and then the big reveal is just Ahsoka comes back like, I'm here to train you, even though you said you wouldn't. It's like, I agree with Keith. That would be a little bit odd. So I feel like it has to be somebody else, but I still don't know who. The, the most common theories I keep seeing online is Luke and Ahsoka. So it seems like people really want us. I mean, I want Ahsoka back in the show, but it would be very weird for her to send them there and then her come down. Like that'd be that that would be so strange to me. Yeah. And the problem with Luke is it just is like how how much of that character is going to be on screen because then you have to do the whole uh tarkin thing from rogue one where he's just going to be de-aged the entire time could be distracting do they want to invest in that i don't know i keep seeing uh sebastian stan like the dream casting is sebastian stan as he does look like him i'm not doubting that it's just that you know we 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 joke about mark hamill in a new hope i still overall love luke skywalker and his performance as that character um i have so much nostalgia for it i just think if you don't need to there's just no reason to cast somebody younger. And I know people are going to say, Matt, you love Solo. And it's like, that felt very purposeful in what they were doing. It was this fun origin story. And I guess my question would be, if you're going to cast Sebastian Stan as Luke, then is he going to be a main character in Mando season three? Or is that setting up some big story? And if that's the case, then fine. I'm fine with it if he's if it's setting up something where he's on screen a lot. But if it's just like a cameo, then... I don't know. Who cares? So I don't know what they're going to do. I feel like I've been pretty clear that I don't want Luke Skywalker in this yeah. show. I think Leia would be sweet. I, yeah, I just think I agree. that would be so cool for fans to see her actually as a Jedi in the show. Obviously, you'd have to recast her. Yeah. Um, so, you know, who knows how that would work. Um, I, I do think it is going to be a Force ghost, and I'm going to yeah. be really uh, disappointed. As long as it's done well, I'm down. Like, I mean, if it's Force ghost and it's Yoda, and I feel like, I feel like on paper, it sounds a little bit like, is that the best we could do? But at the same time, I feel like if the final shot of this se- of this season, I should say, is like um, Frank Oz playing classic Yoda and then little Grogu who can't really communicate all that well sitting across from him. I feel like it's going to be like, oh, man, where's this going? So I don't know. It could be cool. Again, Austin, again, the problem we're facing here is if you're going to have Force Ghost Yoda show up, then Force Ghost Mace Windu has to show up and there's going to be some controversy. Because is it possible that this season ends with Mace Windu dying again? Because if Force Ghost Goost, if Force Ghost Mace shows up to train Grogu while they're escaping on the Slave One and Boba sees his father's killer, he's gonna crash the ship, he's gonna freak out and kill them all. I honestly didn't even think about like what we could get if Mace Windu does show up and Bo- there. Boba just starts shooting Mace Windu Dude, the ghost. That could be cool though. Let's do Mace Windu. Let's I do want that. Mace Windu back. Yeah. I want Mace back. No, no, no. Like you said, my my perfect world is that a live Mace Windu comes back. That's what I want. I want old Sam Jackson coming back yeah. as Mace Windu. If he's a forest ghost, fine, but I want I want him to be alive. What if he comes back carrying Django's head oh, and places it down and throws it at Boba? <laughs> like, fuck you. <laughs> 
I like that's my favorite idea now. Let's do because that. That's yeah, one of the have few, a rematch. Yeah, that's one of the few you can actually do because it's not like a backwards thing with Luke where you have to DH him. It's like you can actually use Sam Jackson, who's in the prequels, and at this point he's probably supposed to be thirty years older. And you can put some makeup on, just like a little bit of makeup on stuff like that. You can make him look older. So I think that could be kind of cool. Maybe we just need our own standalone Mace Windu show. I'd be down. I'm calling it now. That's what I want. Even if he's a Force Ghost, my my expectation is Force Ghost Yoda. My hope is a live Mace Windu. That's what I'm hoping. I think it will be a Force Ghost of some fashion. We know Star Wars loves their Force Ghost. I'll be extremely disappointed if that does happen. I don't think there's a way they could do a Force Ghost and have me be satisfied, but we'll see. (laughs) My dream would be Leia, though. I'd be down with that. I'd be down with that, too. All right, Austin. I mean, I think we nailed it. I mean, obviously, we want to talk about more, but we got to save some of our energy for the finale next week. So let's round this out. What do people need to know, Austin? What shows we got coming soon? Yeah, everybody. Thank you so much for listening. Um, If you enjoyed this episode, please make sure you hit that subscribe button so you never miss any of our upcoming content. Also, if you wouldn't mind sharing us with a friend, that really is the best way to help us continue to grow the show. At The Arnie's is our social and thearnies.media is the website. We'll be back on Tuesday to discuss the Netflix docuseries, the holiday movies that made us. And of course, we will be back next Sunday for the Mandalorian finale. That's right. Austin and I have a lot coming up because we're also going to try and put out a Cyberpunk 2077 first impressions review when Keith is back. We also at some point have to talk about Tenant because that's coming out in a few days. (laughs) There's so much coming out at the end of the year. It's going to be a busy week. I know. It's going to be crazy, but I can't wait. So much good content coming. There's only a couple weeks left of the year. I don't know how we're going to fit it in, but I can't wait to record it all. It's going to be a blast. And also, of course, everybody, please like and follow us over at the Arnie's on social media, particularly Instagram. Send us a DM, like our post, comment, do whatever you want. Let us know what are your thoughts on The Mandalorian Season 2 so far? What are your thoughts on Cyberpunk 2077? Send us your predictions for the Jedi that we'll be getting in the finale of The Mandalorian. Yeah, that's a good one, too. Overrated movies we just talked about, let us know. We have so many topics. Just let us know. What do you, what do you like about the show so far? What are your recommended topics what do you want us to talk about we'd love to hear from you and if you do want to check out our website that once again is the arnies.media on our website you can subscribe to a newsletter to be alerted anytime a new episode drops and of course we are in the planning stages for 2021 so feel free to shoot us an email and send us any ideas or episodes that you want to hear us do for the show that's all we got to say austin we also do have our holiday bracket coming up and i can confirm for you guys that bad santa will not be winning oh did you watch bad santa <laughs> I did, and I hated it. Oh, wow. I've seen it before. I've seen it before, but it, it did not. I'll probably cut this anyways, but it did not hold up for no, me. No, that'd be fun. You should leave this in. That'll be a fun little tease for those excited for our bracket episode. It's your little uh, a little insight on Austin's vote for one of the brackets. Interesting. Yeah, I've started watching some of them, too. I'll just say, Matt, if you have not watched Bad Santa yet, you're probably going to be cringing for some of the jokes. I've seen it. I saw it once a, a few years ago. So I need to rewatch. That was one of the ones I made a point. I need to rewatch it. But uh, who knows, people? Maybe this will be a fun little Easter egg because <laughs> come the holiday bracket <laughs> episode and we don't talk about bad Santa. I'll be like, oh, I guess that, I guess they removed that one. So we'll see how that goes. We might have some last minute uh, um, <laughs> changes. We'll see. Yeah, we, we may have to call an emergency Arnie meeting about that one. <laughs> yeah, we'll see, guys. I'll rewatch it. I'm just going to text Austin. Oh, fuck. So <laughs> we'll see what happens. <laughs> uh, but in the meantime, everybody, thanks so much for watching or not. Wa- I don't. Are you watching? I don't know. But I know you're listening. So thanks for listening. We if appreciate If you're watching, you. that's weird because we're not a video show. Yeah, if Please you're watching, stop watching, you us. might be hacking into my computer, which I don't like. So anyway, we appreciate you listening. You can find us over on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, Google Play. Check us out there. We'll see you this coming week, Tuesday and Sunday for Mandalorian, like Austin mentioned. Thanks again, and this is The Way. Bye, everyone. (laughs) 